Okay, we're now, right, let, shall I start broadcasting? Let's see. Uh, okay, we ready? Yes. All righty, let's go. Hello there. We see some participants coming in. Hi. There we go. The doors are open. I love it. I love it. Come on in. What? I wonder if everybody could hear us as we were talking right before this. So we can't, we can't see anybody right now. We can just see the participants. We had a hundred people registered for this today, right at the All last right. minute. Oh, wow. Well, actually they let you. Hi, hi Linda. When Linda, Linda's with us. She's can in you the see chat. Us here? Oh, wow. Yeah. So we'll, we'll let, we're at 52 participants. We'll let it climb a little bit higher and then we'll get started. So. I'm so happy to be here today and so happy the technology is working because guess what? 15 <laughs> minutes ago, guess what happened 15 minutes ago? Guess what? My internet went down and I had a little moment of, okay, it's going to be that day. And then it came back 15 wow. minutes ago. You know, every program I was on yesterday was people were weaving in and out. The, the internet is so overloaded. And poor Zoom, it's like everybody's using Zoom. So uh, it's, it's quite incredible what's going on. It is super incredible. We have, I think we have 50 people in the room with us right now. Hi, Jen, how are you? And Marsha, you made it. Michael Early, hello, Michael Early. Look at all these wonderful people with us today. So cool. I know, I looked at the list and it was fantastic. So um, Joanna, if you don't mind, how about if we get started? Let's just, let's start, well, we'll have more people I join would us. love to do that. I'm gonna be quiet so you can introduce me. How's that? I like being introduced. <laughs> First of all, I love that you have the beautiful orange behind you, that warm color. Thank you. Um, you're wearing like a warm color, a happy color. So, okay, everybody. First of all, thank you all so much for joining us today. We're so excited to be here and to do this. And it really is a pleasure to have so many familiar faces with us. I looked through the list of a hundred people signed up. I think we even have a waiting list and so many names were familiar. So thank you. We're, we're happy to all be together, even if we can't see each other. So I am Raylan Barlow with National Leadership Institute. And many of you know, we're a nonprofit and we're committed to helping you build a better board and better leaders, better leadership. And that's a little bit about uh, what we're going to talk about today. So. You know, as we're going through these troubled times, you know, we thought at National Leadership Institute, what can we do? What can we do to help? Um, and one way we believe we can help you cope better is share some tips, um, help you be a better leader during these times, and just help you be more optimistic overall. So I think a thing that I want you to remember as we go through this, as Joanna teaches today and does some of our favorite topics, um, Staying positive may matter more than ever before right now because our emotions are directly connected to our immune system. Joanna's gonna talk about that during the session, but think about that for a minute. Your emotions and your immune system are directly connected. So keeping our immune system strong, keeping our emotions positive really is critical right now. So maybe you're getting in a negative space. I know it's tough at home being alone. You might be struggling with that. You might be struggling with children, teaching them at home for the first <laughs> time, or children or grandchildren suddenly being their teacher with, to with topics you may not understand, or you know, maybe you're trying to lead your staff remotely for the very first time, and that is, is truly a challenge for a lot of us. But we want you to know through this session, you can take negative emotions that are creeping up and turn them into positive ones. And there is evidence-based science behind this. And that's something Joanna is going to talk about more. So the evidence-based science behind emotions, behind the science of happiness, it is a rational, physiological, psychological, very complex thing that Joanna has studied for years. So let's get to it. Um, Joanna, for your intro, I could say this much stuff. I could say so many things, but we're just going to do a couple, okay? That's perfect. Um, so our expert, Ms. Joanna Brandy, first of all, thank you for doing that in partnership with National Leadership Institute. She's been one of our most popular instructors for about going on four years now. Every time we do a session together, people ask for more. So we hope you guys feel the same way after this one. Um, she is a certified chief happiness officer. She is a happiness coach, and she is also a specialist in creating customer loyalty and also donor loyalty, because if you think about it, uh, donors and customers are the same thing if you really break it down. So 
Another quick highlight, for more than 21 years, she has been a trusted resource and speaker for Vistage, which is the world's largest network of CEOs in, in, the, in the world. Um, it's an amazing organization. So Joanna, I am done, other than to say, we will That's watch questions. <laughs> Yeah, we'll watch questions. Um, we'll do those in chat at the end. So send your questions as you get them, and we'll answer as many as we can. So now, Beth, I just want to be clear about that. We've disabled the question and answer box, but you can put all your questions in the chat box. That way, we're only monitoring one thing. That'd be great. Okay, go. I, gonna, I can go now. I'm going to turn my video off. No more video. See okay. you soon. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Raylan. I always appreciate your introductions. So we have a few goals today. We're going to explore the seven ways to use evidence-based science of happiness to create more positive outcomes in your life and better understand the connection between your thoughts and your immune system, like Raylan said. We're going to add a few positivity practices to your daily routine. And these things are going to improve your performance and productivity, whether you're at work or home. They're also going to decrease your anxiety and your fear because we're all experiencing the same thing, especially when the clicker doesn't work. There we go. Unprecedented, unparalleled, and unbelievable times. Everything stopped everything stopped. Everything you knew as your regular normal life has slowed down for some of you to a halt. Planes are grounded, we're grounded. So we are faced now with so many new realities, not the least of which is the 24-hour news cycle that's creating a tremendous amount of fear, unintentionally, I'm sure. But, you know, we get it now. We're in trouble. We have to take precautions. We are under stay-at-home orders. We shouldn't go out except for very necessary things. We get that. So at some point, we are all faced with the choice point. And the choice point is, do we keep watching it? Do we keep absorbing it? Do we keep focusing on it? Or can we make another choice? Can we respond to this differently? I see it this way. It's like there are two paths. One is the path of positivity. It's making the conscious choice whenever you can to think the higher thought, to reframe a situation into the positive, to ask the question, as Ray Lynn asked in the beginning, what can I do to help? Such an important question. This is the time for us to raise ourselves up so that the fear doesn't get us. Because if we go down the other road and the fear gets us, what begins to happen is we actually work against our own immune system. So we may be taking vitamin C and zinc and all the things they told us to take. However, if on the other hand, we're watching the news and we're talking about this with other people and we're into a how awful can it be? Are we disasterizing or awfulizing or catastrophizing at this point? Then we are literally making ourselves sick. You see, your body hears everything you say. And every interaction, whether that's a thought, whether that's a spoken word, whether that's uh, how you're conversing with someone else, every interaction that you have, every thought that you have, every change in your mental emotional state, whether it's conscious or unconscious, and that's key because 95% of our mind is unconscious to us, every change in that mental emotional state, conscious or unconscious, is accompanied by a change in the physiological state of the body. This is Dr. Elmo Green, who was a pioneer in biofeedback and how the body works. And neuroscientists can now tell us that positivity and negativity actually reside in a different place in our brain. When we are feeling those wonderful feelings of positivity, the neurons in our left prefrontal cortex begin lighting up. When we are feeling feelings of negativity and diminishment and fear, the neurons in the right prefrontal cortex light up. And the interesting thing, this was a turning point in my life, the interesting thing is they can't, that can't happen at the same time. You can't be positive and negative at the same time. So you get to have a choice. Is it you're gonna to react to something with positivity or negativity? I've developed my own strategies all these years on how to get more positive when I'm faced with a negative situation. So when I see, when I hear, when I experience myself going down that road of negativity, I give myself a new direction. 
I say stop and turn left. Now that's my cue, may not make sense to you, but it makes sense to me. That's my cue to say, how do we get the neurons in the left side of my brain lighting up? Because I can't be negative if I'm being positive. We think 60,000 thoughts a day. Imagine that. Imagine how many we're thinking now. The estimates vary, of course. But of those 60,000 thoughts that we think today, 90% of them are the same thoughts we thought yesterday. And 80% of those, according to the experts, are most likely to be negative. 60,000 thoughts a day, and how many of them are positive? How many of them are conscious? How many of them are negative? Very important to understand because the thoughts we think make up the stories we tell about ourselves and others, which eventually become the dramas that we play out in our lives. And we get what we expect. There's a very interesting law out there. It's called the law of expectancy. And I've known about it for a long time because we've been doing experiments for years in the field of psychology about it. But there was an interesting study done very recently by one of my colleagues, Sean Aker, the author of The Happiness Advantage. A group of psychologists do what psychologists do and wanted to study whether or not this law of expectancy was really true. So they went into seven different hotels and they asked if they could be working with the, uh, the housekeepers. And half of the employees were told how much exercise they were getting every day through their work, how many calories they were burning with all the reaching, vacuuming, and moving around they did. And the other half, the control group, was, was told nothing. Several weeks later, at the end of the experiment, the housekeepers who'd been primed to think of their work as exercise actually lost weight and their cholesterol levels dropped. They did nothing else except think differently. You see, believing in positive outcomes is the first step to getting positive outcomes. Half of the employees believed and the other half weren't given that information, so nothing happened in their lives. A number of years ago, there was something called the Oak School Experiment. Now, this is pretty famous because it was probably the first one done. Psychologists went into a school and asked the principal, of course, to participate in the experiment, but asked the principal for the names of children at random and the names of their teachers. The parents were told nothing. They then went to the teachers and gave them the names of these children and told them that these children were all about to become budding little geniuses. And this was the year that they were going to blossom. They were told nothing else. And at the end of the school year, the children, who were just average kids, the children who were picked at random, displayed something very different than all the other children. They had a statistically significant boost in their IQ. So we got what we expect with others and with ourselves. When I first began studying happiness, I studied happiness with Dr. Martin Seligman, who's the founding father of positive psychology. He's also the author of a book called Learned Optimism, which I read, I don't know, way more than 20 years ago. And when I read Learned Optimism, I learned that I wasn't. I learned that I wasn't an optimist, even though I thought I was. It seems that optimism has to do with your explanatory style. Winston Churchill put it this way, the pessimist sees difficulties in every opportunity and the optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. Important to let that one sink in. It seems that pessimists have a way of explaining negative information as something that's very permanent, very pervasive in their life. I like to say it this way, down here in Florida, when it's season and it rains on someone's vacation, a pessimist is going to complain and say, oh my God, every time I come here, it rains. Every time I go on vacation, it rains. That's a pessimist. Very pervasive. It's very permanent in their language and they're internalizing. And it's very personal. That's how I like to remember those Ps. Optimists, on the other hand, when faced with a negative situation, are pretty sure it's temporary. Oh, it's raining today. It's Florida. It'll stop raining in a half hour. And they go on with their life. It's only happening for this moment. Now, of course, we are dealing with a specific situation here, which has challenged all of us beyond anywhere we've ever believed before. But we still have the opportunity 
to think about it in either a pessimistic or an optimistic way. Pessimistic life insurance agents sell less. Pessimis pessimistic undergraduates have lower grades than SATs. Pessimistic swimmers have substantially less uh, substandard times. And pessimistic hit hitters and pitchers do worse in a close game than the optimistic ones. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Optimists, on the other hand, live with a sense of hope and faith and joy. Even if, even if there are tough times, they find how to have joy in the little things. Optimists are healthier, more creative, and more open to possibility than pessimists. Optimists have more fun. They have lower blood pressure, they have lower cortisol, and they have fewer heart attacks. And here's the crowning glory. Optimists live seven to nine years longer than pessimists. Now, some people, when I talk to them about being an optimist or being a pessimist, people say to me, well, I'm a realist. That's okay. Psychologists have studied that too. Realists are actually pessimists. And you know what? I'd rather live seven to nine years longer as an optimist and not be so realistic. So here's how it works. Every time you have a feeling or a thought, I'm going to call them thought feelings because we're not sure what comes first. Your body makes a chemical. When you have a thought or feeling of goodness, of possibility, of hope, of joy, you create what we call the chemicals of calm. And that turns on your parasympathetic nervous system. So you create endorphins and serotonin and oxytocin and dopamine. And that turns on the part of your body that knows how to heal the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. But when we have thoughts or feelings of negativity, we create the chemicals of fear because our body believes that we need to fight or flee. And that turns on the sympathetic nervous system, which houses the fight or flight reaction. And that dumps a lot of cortisol, adrenaline, and about 50 other biochemicals into our body. So in case we've got a jump up and get out of there, we can. And then as human beings, of course, we're natural storytellers. So then we start telling stories about the thought or feeling that we have. And those internal stories either spiral up or spiral down. You see, we've got this primal part of the brain. I still call it the crocodile brain. That is the part that when faced with something new, when faced with something it's never seen before, is put on alert. Now, this is really useful to have because when we hear a, a, a loud sound in a dark parking lot at night, this is the part that gets alerted. This is, it's a wonderful function and it's there to take care of us. But unfortunately, we can get locked into the primal part of the brain. Brief biology lesson. Our brain actually has three layers and the lower brain function, which is the primal brain or the reptilian brain, the same one we share with the crocodiles, is what gets activated when we're in fear. That makes sense, but we don't want to stay in fear because it starts pushing out all those chemicals. So the mid part of the brain is uh, the mammalian brain, as they call it, and that's emotion and memory. And that houses the amygdala, the part of our system that gets activated and then stores the information to tell us never to go back to that place again or not to touch the hot stove again or don't eat that mushroom again because there have been negative consequences. And then there's the higher brain function, <clears throat> which, excuse me, which is the crowning glory of human beings. And that's our intellectual, that's our, those are our executive functions. That's how we can analyze things and be intellectual. And they're all operating at the same time unless we shut the neocortex down, which sometimes happens because we're hardwired for hard times. So when we have that stress reaction, when we're watching the news, and I'm going to talk today a lot about watching the news because you can overwatch the news and you can put yourself into this reaction. So when we have that stress reaction, there's a stimulus and then that natural reaction to fight or flee. The reaction is often based on something in the past, a fear that we've heard in the past, or something in the future that we imagine is going to be bad. The body produces those 50 plus stress chemicals and all the blood rushes out to our arms and legs, to our extremities, because we may have to fight and we may have to run or we may have to lift up a truck, who knows? That blood rushes out to the extremities and where's that blood coming from? That's coming from the non-essential systems in your body. So when we go into the fight, flight or freeze response, 
all the non-essential systems shut down. Guess what's there? Your immune system is there. Your immune system is a non-essential system when you need fight or flight. So that's, prob that's what tends to happen. The non-essential digestion, all the other systems shut down so you can fight or flee quickly. And what happens to your brain is the neuro neocortex shuts down and it narrows the function so that you can look around and see what's wrong. So if you were out in the woods and you suspected that there was a bear, a foot or something like that, because maybe you saw something or heard something, you would then begin to narrow your attention and only look for other things that are wrong in the environment, uh, a broken branch or bear poop or something like that, that would actually say, okay, there's a bear or there's not a bear. So this is a beautiful reaction, except our bodies were only designed to use it occasionally. And estimates have been that this happens to all of us human beings living in modern times about 50 times a day. Who knows how many times it's happening now in the age of coronavirus. And here's the important piece about this. This can turn your immune system off for six to up to six hours. So let that sink in. Whenever you allow yourself to stay in that stress, to be in the area of awfulizing, disasterizing, catastrophizing, and getting that, you're shutting your own immune system down for up to six hours, according to the research that's being done and have been done out in the university at, at the Institute of Heart Math in California, where I've studied. You see, the thoughts you think make up the stories you tell about yourselves and others, which becomes the drama that you begin to play out in your life. Now, those stories that we tell either spiral that emotion up because it's a good story and we're watching all the good things that are happening and we're laughing and we're taking this time to enjoy the moments that we have with our family. Or last night I had, I had a uh, full moon party on Zoom. So all the people that I would have invited to the beach to enjoy the full moon party, enjoy the full moon with me, or they were online last night. At least a few of them were. It was so much fun. And we talked about the good stuff. The other scenario is we get into that awfulizing and we go down, 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 down into that what I call the rabbit hole. Storytelling's in our blood, so we're not going to stop telling stories. What we can do is change the stories we're telling ourselves, because the most important story we tell is the story that we tell ourselves. So what are you telling yourself about what's going on in your life now? Are you strong? Are you focused? Are you a survivor? Are you a thriver? That's the story. What, this is a time where this is, this is a defining moment in all our lives right now. How are we gonna move forward in face of this? The book is blank. This is the time. You can change how you're thinking. You can change what you do. This is the moment to figure out, are you doing what your, what your heart's desire is? Or is this an opportunity for you to make a turn? Maybe to the left, who knows? <sighs> I take a breath. As Americans, we grow up believing that we have unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it just turns out that in Thomas Jefferson's day, the actual definition of the word pursuit meant practicing. So maybe what our founding forefathers really meant was, we're not supposed to be chasing after happiness, we're supposed to be practicing it. That's what I think. Happiness is a practice. It's a process, not a place. It's a habit and it's a really good habit. It's a skill that can be learned and practiced. And if anybody can learn, if I can learn it, anybody can learn it. It's a work ethic, especially in my life. It's a choice that actually changes the physical structure of your brain. It's a muscle you can exercise, just like if you wanna build your biceps. It doesn't just feel good, it is actually good for you because it produces a new set of chemicals for your body. And it happens to be a competitive business strategy because when you can create a level of happiness in your organization, you can outthink other organizations. Happiness right now is being considered a KPI, a key performance indicator. It can be measured, it's evidence-based, it's definable, it's predictable, and it's changeable. So happiness is beginning, the importance of happiness is seeping into every area in our lives. Einstein said, the world we create is a product of our thinking. So if you want to change your world, change your thinking. Now, this was the biggest revelation that I had ever heard in my life when I began studying. Every one of us has a happiness set point. Just like that weight set point, we all have a happiness set point. 
It acts as a happiness or as an emotional thermometer, a thermostat, so to speak. And because our body likes the state of homeostasis, right? We get a fever, the fever comes down. We run really hard and our heart rate goes up and then we stop and then our heart rate goes down because our body wants us in that state of homeostasis. So even when we get really happy, we are always gonna come back to our level of happiness, our genetic level of happiness. It's an adaptation response and it is believed to be about 50% genetic, which is why lottery winners, after just a few months, they get back to their normal level of happiness. And after a year, they are actually at their normal level of happiness, or they've gone backwards because they don't like what's happening in their lives with people asking for money and things like that. The same is true, believe it or not, for quadriplegics who've been studied. Even though they're dealing with drastic, drastic changes in their life, several months usually five, six months into it, their happiness level gets back to whatever their set point was. So let me explain a little further. Call this the happiness pie. My pie happens to be a pizza. It's 50% genetic. So some of us are born on the happy side of the pie and some of us, like me, are not born happy. Cranky, col colicky, annoying, you know, and, and our parents respond to us in a certain way, depending on how, whether or not they're getting sleep and whether or not they can function in their lives. So people ask me all the time, well, how do you know if it's genetic or how do you know if it's, if it's a, a nature or nurture? I think it's both. But any of you who have more than two children may have noticed they're all born different. Some of them are happier than others. So 50% of your happiness is genetic. If you're lucky enough, to have that 50% on your side, great. It's not so hard for you. For me, a little different. 10% of your happiness comes from your circumstances, where you work, where you live, whether or not you're sick, whether or not you're married, whether or not you've got a good social circle around you. By the way, I'm going to say something about this term social distancing. Stop using it. What we're being asked to do is physical distancing. The human system cannot work without social interaction. And I hear that word over and over again. Every email that comes out, everything I see says social distancing. Do not allow yourself to hear that. Physical distancing, yes. Stay six feet away from me. Don't get in my space. That's fine. However, don't think about it as social distancing because you'll begin, your body believes everything you say, you'll begin to pull away from other people. And you want to be out there more with people, not in person, but we have a lot of tools. You can have a virtual cocktail party. You can have meetings like this. You can have family. I have a friend of mine had a lovely family meeting on Sunday. I was really jealous. It was like, wow, do you think I could get my whole family on the phone for a phone call on a Sunday afternoon? I'm going to try it because we want social interaction while having physical distancing. And 40%, 40% of your happiness comes from your habitual thoughts, feelings, and actions, things that are in your voluntary control. Now, if we were in a workshop together, we'd spend about 20 minutes on this exercise talking about what habits, patterns, and attitudes are in your voluntary control. But because we're trying to put so much information in here for you today, I'm just going to give you the highlights of what I always hear. Number one is exercise. Number two is sleep. Number three is the people you hang out with, the books you read, the music you listen to, the places you go to, whether or not you get time in nature, whether or not you have worthwhile relationships in your life. There are all these kinds of things that you can change completely in your voluntary control. I've been doing a lot of strange things since I've been sequestered here. And one of the things that's in my voluntary control is, you know, I, I get tired of hearing myself think, so I've started singing, and I find that I love it. And I also know, being in the field, that when you sing or when you hum, you build your vagal tone. Your vagal nerve is the 10th cranial nerve. It goes all the way down your back and into your organs. So if you want to invigorate your organs, very simple thing you can do. You can hum and you can sing. It's been so much fun. I feel like I'm back in high school in the Glee Club. Your habitual thinking patterns encourage you to improve, to grow, and to expand, or they cause you to narrow and contract. Because you can't continue to tell the story 
of where you were and move in this same direction and move in the new direction of the new story that your life is willing to become and waiting to become. You can't continue to tell the story of where you were. So it's time to walk away from that old story. So if you want to change your reality, you start with changing your thinking. So you change your thinking. So you get new thoughts, new choices, new actions and behaviors, new experiences, new feelings, and a new state of being. It's fairly simple. It's fairly iterative. And it's all within your power. Because you're not going to get to where you want to go with your old thinking. One of my favorite teachers is Dr. Joe Dispenza. I'm trying to remember the, the name of uh, his first book, which I love so much, uh, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. And he says, the moment you move on to an elevate, of elevated emotion, you are more prone to see the possibilities about yourself and your life that you never saw before. And the immortal words of Max Planck, the, the discoverer, if you will, of quantum physics, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So I'm going to ask you to change the way you look at happiness today. Because happiness is not a vague state of mind. It's a specific measurable physical state of the body. There's distinct brain activity, heart rhythm, and body chemistry. Positive emotions make us smarter. When in a state of positive emotion, the right hemisphere of our, of our brain and the left hemisphere of our brain begin communicating better together. So we get a more holistic view and, and our peripheral vision actually widens. So you can literally see more when you are in a positive state. It's called the broaden and build response. And when you're there, you have better memory, you have better recall, you're better at analysis, even complex analysis. Doctors are better at their diagnosis when they are primed for positive emotion. Positive emotions make us healthier because of all those fabulous chemicals I talked about before. And one other thing, when we are in a state of positive emotion, our body is building killer T cells. Those are the cells that kill the invading viruses. So if you want your body to work as it was designed to work, you want to spend more time in positive emotion than negative emotion, because that's what's going to build those T cells far more than the vitamin C will. Positive emotions make us more socially adept. We just had that discussion. It gives us the opportunity as we look in other, other people's eyes, even if it's through a situation like this, makes us more socially adept. It also makes us more likable because people like positive people. Nine, nine out of 10 people say that in the presence of positive people, they're more protective. Well, of course. So it makes us more socially adept and more likable. So eventually it makes us wealthier. And you are most likely to achieve the upper levels of your potential in anything, whether it's music, sports, business, or parenting, or relationships, when you experience more positive emotions. And here's the good news. You know, there are people, I get a lot of pushback, I deal a lot with executives, and I get a lot of pushback on the word happiness. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. If you don't like the word happiness because it now looks like a yellow smiley face to you, it's okay. These are all the positive emotions you could choose to enjoy. So if you can't feel what you call happiness, feel inspiration instead, or feel joy, or do something that tickles your curiosity, or look at some of these gorgeous pictures of natural landscapes and fall into a state of awe. I think awe is the highest of all the positive emotions. Choose your positive emotions and choose them well. Because Dr. Rick Hansen, who is a neuroscientist, tells us that negative emotions are like Velcro. They stick in our mind because when we experience a negative emotion, it imprints itself in two different places in our mind, not only the left prefrontal cortex, but deep in the mammalian brain so that we can remember it. So we'll know which mushrooms are poisonous or which dark alleys not to walk down or you know which people to stay away from. Negative emotions stick. Positive emotions, on the other hand, he says, are like Teflon and they slide off. And that makes sense from an evolutionary capacity because if all we ever did was stop and smell the flowers, we would have gotten eaten. So here's my 22nd rule. We know that it's not enough to just have that fleeting positive emotion. Oh, it's a beautiful day. Oh, the sky is blue. Isn't it lovely? Love where I live. No. 
you want to take what you are feeling, you want to take that positive emotion and you want to let it sink in. So be sure that you are being with it, turn a positive emotion into a positive experience and hold on to it for at least 20 seconds so it can do its magic in your body. Now here's something that's so stunning to me, has been from the moment I learned it. Negative emotion can shut your immune system down for six hours, up to six hours. Positive emotion can build your immune system for six hours. So the choice is yours. We're standing at a crucible right now. What path are you going to walk down? The path that's fraught with negative emotion and shut your own immune system down and possibly get sick? Or staying in a state of positive emotion and doing the very best you can to build your immune system? I can't tell you you won't get sick, but I can tell you you'll, you'll enjoy your life more. You'll enjoy your people more. You'll enjoy everything in your life more. If you focus on, how can I be a little bit more positive? According to the psychologists, the human body works best when it's positive five times more than when it's negative. Stunning. Stunning. And when I took, there is a, there is a website that my teacher, Barbara Fredrickson, has. It's called PositivityRatio.com. And you can go and measure what your positivity ratio is. Let me tell you, when I measured mine, I was shocked. I wasn't anywhere near where I needed to be and I've gotten much better at it. You see, we can train our brains to be happier. The brain is what neuroscientists call plastic, and that just means it's malleable. So when we have all these new neurons firing together, we're building new neural pathways. So as we build the muscle of happiness, as we go through our positivity practices, as we interact with others in a positive way, as we search for the good news, as we look for awe, as we experience savoring and all the wonderful ways that you can create your new habits and your new attitudes, you're actually building new neural pathways in your brain. For me, this has been huge because not being born happy, I really needed to know that if all this practice was going to get me somewhere, and boy, it sure has, because I have built a new neural pathways. It doesn't mean I don't go down the road of disaster and catastrophizing. It doesn't mean I don't go down the road. It means I don't get far down the road before I pull myself back and say, wait a minute, I have another choice. And that's what happens when you do it as well. There's a whole science around happiness. So this is all of the stuff that I'm telling you today and sharing with you today is all validated in science. There is a science of happiness. And that's because the human system is supposed to be positive five times more than it is negative and the science is now showing us how. Barbara Fredrickson says the tipping point is three to one, three times more positivity than negativity. And we cross that line between languishing and flourishing. Since Barbara's work, there have been a number of scientists working on this, and what we have discovered, especially in the world of business, is that there's a high performance ratio too. When you, when you have and when you deliver five times more acknowledgement, affirmation, praise, goodwill, recognition, compliments, and focus on strengths, rather than sarcasm or criticism, you're going to get to your high performance ratio, and people, the human beings involved, will perform better. When you focus on questions, and questions are really important, when you focus on questions that are, that are um, about what's strong, so where your strengths are and how can you better deal with all this, and when you focus on what's right and what you want to create rather than what's wrong and what needs to be fixed and what you don't want, you get to that high performance ratio. But look at the numbers, five times more. I get so much pushback on this. This is a, a, a cornerstone tenant in positive leadership. And I get so much pushback because a lot of times a business owner will say, well, that's what I pay them for. Why should I have to praise them? Well, <laughs> because that's the way it is. We need that acknowledgement. The human system needs that acknowledgement and that recognition. And uh, these figures are coming from Dr. Kim Cameron at the University of Michigan. But Dr. John Gottman and his wife have been studying happy marriages for 40 years. And guess what? In happy marriages, there's a five to one ratio of positivity to negativity. So I'm going to give you now seven ways you can change your thinking and create more positive outcomes. Number one, become the witness. Become the witness. 
learn to notice what you notice. Number one, number one in positive leadership, learn to notice what you notice. Where is your attention going? If you're a writer like me, you're fairly good at being a witness because you're used to listening to other people's stories and not making judgments. So this is about witnessing what goes on in your head without necessarily making a judgment about it, but just noticing where your attention is and where it's going. Noticing those 60,000 thoughts, because this is an important piece. Dr. Daniel Amen tells us that we are having, in the course of a day, many, 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 what he calls ants, automatic negative thoughts. Automatic negative thoughts. They play over and over again. That's the, that's the 80% that's you know, negative every day. And the problem with automatic negative thoughts is that they stimulate the areas of the brain that are responsive for depression and anxiety. So if you want to be depressed, start ruminating on all the negative things in your life. Or you can become the witness and just notice where are you thinking negative thoughts that may be very old thoughts, that may be very outdated thoughts, and may be extremely untrue. Positive thoughts are really expansive. So I'm a believer in affirmations. And when you begin to have a mantra of things like, things always work out for me, or I'm good at what I do. I enjoy my life. I am so grateful. Life is good. Despite everything, life is still good. Human nature is good. I'm healthy and strong. I can do this. When you begin to have those thoughts, what you're doing is you're really opening up your horizons. You will become three to 10 times more creative when you focus on positive thoughts. Three to 10 times more creative. And in the business world, where we track those KPIs, those key performance indicators, we've seen anywhere <coughs> at the high end between 300 to 400% more innovation when people are happy and positive. That makes sense. Pessimists doesn't actually invent many things, do they? So dispute your inner thinking. I call it channeling your inner lawyer. I was raised by lawyers, so I know how to do that really well. This beautiful lady here is Byron Katie, who does something she calls the work, and I call it the inner lawyer. She says to ask yourself the question about the thought, is it true? Can you absolutely know it's true? What happens when you believe that thought? And who or what would you be without the thought? And then she challenges us to turn the thought around. You can find, oh, I should have had her name on there, I'm sorry, Byron, B-Y-R-O-N, Katie, K-A-T-I-E, and you can find her magnificent work on the internet. So channel your inner lawyer, challenge yourself. Adjust that explanatory style, adjust it, because your body can't tell the difference between something that's real and something that's vividly imagined. So how can you create that explanatory style of an optimist. How can you say, this is temporary, this is specific, this is not gonna last forever, I know we can do this. How can you create the language and the thinking style of an optimist? Are you being a victor or will you be, are you being a victim or will you be a victor? So how you interpret situations has everything to do with how your body responds to it. Now in the beginning, I have to say, I walked down this path dramatizing, catastrophizing, awfulizing, and disasterizing. I just didn't allow myself to stay there very long. One of the things that we can do is to watch the helpers. And that's an important thing to tell your kids in any kind of a, a tragic situation like this, is, is to learn about the strength of human nature by watching the people that are helping. So you can be the victor you can be the victor and you can be a helper. And keep asking that question. My last newsletter I wrote, that was the name of it. How can I help? Just keep asking people, how can I help? It will flood your body with good chemicals. You see, your body can't tell the difference between something that's real and something that is vividly imagined. So allow yourself to vividly imagine the good stuff. I actually consider myself a recovering pessimist because it keeps me in line. But what I aspire to is what I call realistic optimism. The ability to maintain a positive outlook without denying the reality. I am not denying the reality. I got my mask. You know, I got my wipes. I'm washing my hands. But I'm also knowing that as the human species, we will overcome. 
we will find hope. We will find what we need. We will come to each other's aid. So it's actively appreciating the positive aspects of the situation, whether that's getting closer to your family or delving deeper into your spiritual life. We, I've heard all kinds of stories of what people are doing with this time that they never had before. So it's actively appreciating the positive access uh, aspects of the situation without ignoring the negative. You're responding, but you're not reacting, and that's the difference. You're not going into that uh, fight or flight reaction. So in that line, reach for a higher thought. Reach for a higher thought, because you can, I know this is the second time I'm showing this slide, but I would show it 10 times if I could, train your brain to be happier, because neurons that fire together, wire together. So reach for that higher thought. Reach for that better thinking. Ask yourself the, the questions that will help you get there. Lean into a more positive space so you can lean forward. You can look up. The, um, in, in positive psychology, we talk about the fact that the, um, there's something called the heliotropic effect. And if you put a plant near a window and it's not getting enough light, the plant will turn itself because all human systems will move in the direction of light. So lean into that place. Ask yourself, what else is possible here? How can I feel better about this? What's a way to reframe this situation so I can feel good about myself? It's a whole series of questions you can begin to ask yourself. So number five is learn how to ask better questions because every quest begins with a question. And the quality of questions you ask determines the quality of the answers you get. So are you telling yourself empowering questions or asking yourself empowering questions or disempowering questions? How can I make this work? How can I make it better? When I had trouble with my weight, I used to say, how can I eat like the thin ones? <laughs> how can I be more brilliant through this? How can I use this time to create fabulous things? How can I create more joy in the life of my family and friends? How can I set the stage for success? Those disempowering questions aren't gonna get you anywhere. And in fact, they're gonna take you down the rabbit hole and you don't wanna be there right now. So isolate the good stuff. Learn how to focus on all the good things in your life. A book of positive aspects is one of my favorites. You can use, if you're having trouble with one individual person and we all have that person in our life that bugs us, sit down and write down everything positive that you can think of about that person. Keep a blessing book at the end of the day. Write down the three good things that happened to you that day and why. And learn how to savor. When I first went to, I'll call it happiness school, um, we had to take some sort of a test to see where we were weak. And for me, it was pleasure. So my homework was to learn how to savor things. And it was so fun because I practiced on chocolate. So learn how to savor a good meal. Don't eat in front of the TV. Savor your food. Enjoy the sunset. Enjoy the fragrance of the spring flowers. What you focus on expands. So get yourself a good gratitude practice. Keep a journal and write down things you're grateful for daily. I now do it twice a day, once in the morning and once at night. Send an appreciation email to someone every morning. It'll make their day. Write a gratitude letter to someone you've never thanked for something they've done for you and tell people what you appreciate about them. And get out of your mind and into your body. You can't go to the gym right now, but there's a lot of things you can do. A lot of teachers are having classes online. I believe we need to shake off that cortisol. So shimmy it out, shake it off. I get up a couple of times a day and bounce on my heels. I'm not gonna do it now, but I get up and I also bounce. I have a, I have a bouncy chair. <laughs> bounce, get up and bounce and shake and move the energy out of your body. That's what the, that's what the system is supposed to do. We're supposed to move. We're not supposed to ruminate. We're supposed to move. So get out of your mind and into your body to shake off some of the cortisol. <sighs> is there a return on happiness? You bet there is. Resilience and collaboration, energy, meaning, appreciation, growth, openness. In business, there's profit. In life, there's peace of mind. So focus on some of these happiness habits or positivity practices that I've shared today. And now's the time to ask me some questions. So Raylan, you wanna come back here with me? I hope I can see you when you do. I keep looking at this little box on the side. I'm sorry, that's where, that's where my picture is. Raylan, can I see your gorgeous face? There you are. 
I can't, I can't see me, but I can see you. Joanna, okay, first of all, wow, that was so much amazing information. And, and I want to share with people that a lot of times when we do this or in the past, Joanna, you do this information sometimes in a three-hour workshop. Oh, yeah. an eight hour workshop. So we, we realized this was a lot of emotion or a lot of information <laughs> that was shared with you. But I just, um, I just want to read a couple of highlights that really stuck out with me. And, you know, I think it gives us new meaning to mind over matter. Oh yeah. Um, it's a real simple way to boil it down to I'm mind sorry, over matter. I didn't, I didn't want to go there. Let me see if I can get back. Let me see if oh, I can get back there. That's okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, let's just stay there for right now. One one other thing that I think was really was real. There's so many so many takeaways from this, and I, I think again, if we in a workshop scenario, and we're talking about taking this to a virtual workshop where we could do something more with it and really put some exercises into it and work with you guys that way, since we are keeping physical distance, not social distancing. I love that. Um, but you know what you said about positive emotions. Positive emotions build more T cells, even than vitamin C. So keep taking your vitamin C, folks. But that positive effect that you can bring to your own body is so powerful. And I think if people walk away with anything from this today, it's just knowing how much you control you have over your own health. So um, just I, I took so many notes. We've got <laughs> we've got clapping in the chat button. We've and the only question we have so far is the name of the book at the top when you were talking about the primal brain. Could you repeat the name of that book? I believe Mary was Mary missed the name of one of the books. So maybe we'll send out a list after this. Yeah, I, I was probably Learned Optimism. Learned Optimism. Okay. Mm -hmm. By so Dr. Mary, Martin Seligman. Okay. Mary, if you're still here, that is probably the book that you were referring to. I put two others in the chat. Um, okay. And I think... I am shocked because we have no questions. That means you explained it perfectly. No, I need some questions. <laughs> and Make my day. Ask me a question. <laughs> yeah. So, um, questions? what about exercise? You talked a little bit about exercise. That seems to be the go-to source if you're feeling down, feeling bad. People say exercise increase your endorphins. Um, what what works more positive thinking or exercise or is can you compare the two? Oh, you I, I would not even try to compare the two it's it's all the, it's all that habitual stuff that you do um exercise is so necessary that tal ben shahar who was the first professor to teach this at harvard says that if you don't exercise at least three times a week for 30 minutes each time that you might as well be taking a depressant pill because the body will begin to produce the chemicals that will cause depression. Wow. Yes. And Duke wow. University tells us that in studies of um, antidepressant drugs, that exercise actually does better for people that, than antidepressant drugs. So it's more powerful than any antidepressant drug on the market, according to the study that I'm quoting. So okay. that's how important exercise is. And my suggestion now is especially if you're at home and you're not used to being at home, get out twice a day. And sunshine also, by the way, sunshine kills the virus. So those of us here in Florida are really lucky because we can go out and get sanitized anytime we want to. <laughs> I mean, I miss my beach. Minutes. I really, minutes, right? I really miss my beach. I've been, I've been trying to do 20 minutes at a time twice a day if possible. So that in the morning I'm getting, and by the way, if you're having trouble sleeping, that morning walk, you reset your circadian rhythm when, you're, when your brain begins to sense that it's daytime. And uh, too many of us, Raylan and I have had this discussion, too many of us are on these devices way too late at night. I read every doctor that's out there at least 90 minutes from the time you put this down and turn it off before you go to bed. So that means you got to do this kind of early. I have an alarm set to remind me every night, okay, who's gonna call me at this hour anyway? And I really don't want the interaction with the electromagnetic frequency at that hour because it's the blue light actually disturbs your sleep. It, it works on your brain. So we have a question from Tony. Hi, Tony. I'm so glad you could join us today. Hey, so Tony. Joni's question is, if your genetic level is 50% or higher, is it harder to maintain a positive, a positive happiness level? 
Is there a constant battle of your emotional state? No, no, because the more that you build those neural pathways, the easier it's it easier becomes. Because I'm not a genetically happy person. I lean towards anxiety. Um, I've also had PTSD, so I've worked pretty hard to get to the place that I'm at. Um, so no, once once you get there, you may slip a little bit, and you may have to remind yourself. I constantly go, turn left, girl, turn left. Uh, you may have to remind yourself to to go and find something but there are so many techniques you can use to do that that's how i ended up writing 54 ways to stay positive i just started collecting them it was as simple as that somebody i was in a workshop in new jersey and somebody said to me well joanna how do you stay positive in a negative world i was like Ugh. so i spoke what i knew at that moment and then I went back and I started compiling a list of them because at the time that client had me on a retainer and every month I had to send in, back then it was an audio tape and I had to send in an audio tape. So it was 13 ways and then it was, it was 26 ways and then it was 35, you know, so you can build your own, build your own book, build your own, uh, you can put them in a box. You can take little slips of paper and put down all these different ways that you can be happier, put them in a box. And when you're not feeling good, stick your hand in the box and pull it up. So many, I have, I have a client that's using a gratitude jar and they put their gratitudes in a jar and it sits on the team table. Mm -hmm. I got so many ideas on this stuff. So certainly feel free to ask because if you make the choice, you know, you know, this right line, it all starts with choice. What do you want to be? How do you want to be in the world? And I think this is a reset for all of us. How do you want to be in the world? You know, you said something and we will wrap it up here. We're coming up on the, um, we've got about three minutes left, so we're going to wrap it up. But you said something about um, uh, being a realist versus um, a realistic, pessimist. A realist but, optimist. Yeah, because it's interesting. I think a lot of people go, oh, I'm not a pessimist. I'm, I'm a realist. I look at the realist. That's what a lot of people stuff. say, yeah. And there's, there's a fine line between being a realist and a pessimist. And I've noticed that since I've been working with you over the last couple of years and doing these sessions, I can I can find that line a lot better. I think it's an important yeah. important distinction. So all right, so let's wrap it up, Joanna. I think you have some sources for us, and then we will work on turning this into a, a workshop with exercises that we could do virtually all together. But Joanna, let's wrap it up. The exercises are so much fun too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I have prepared a special report because there were not there just wasn't enough time to do a whole lot of positivity practices. So if you go to returnonhappiness.com slash positive doing, there's a report on how you take your positive thinking and turn it into positivity, positive doing. So you're getting positivity practices. So that's a Tony, that's a great list for you uh, because you can sort them out in any one you want. You can try them. People can have little groups and they can say, here's what I tried this week. That's a great way to do it. That's what, that's what we did as happiness coaches. We met once a week. Very good, good. And we are at 1258, so I think we have a final closing slide. So thank you again, everyone. We did this in partnership with Joanna National Leadership Institute. Again, we've been working together going on close to four years now and doing sessions. They have been some of our most popular. And if you think about all this amazing amount of information, and we realize it was a lot, <laughs> um, you, can, you can take it back to your family, to your workplace, to your friendships, to your religious organization, but in every aspect, some of the things that Joanna talked about today can really make a difference. So thank you for joining us. We will be in touch. We will get the recording out to you and stay safe and keep your physical distance. So thank you everyone. <laughs> and be happy. Yes. And, and be, be happy. Positive. Let's just leave it that way. Be positive. Be positive yes. and, and take the time to be grateful. And absolutely. Raylan, I'm grateful to, to you and to National Leadership Institute and to all of you who showed up today because without you, I'd be talking to myself. And on that note, we will end the webinar and say goodbye. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Bye. See you soon.